Thank you so much for inviting me to give this presentation on my latest work, Unfolding Consciousness, and my greetings also to the Theosophical Society in America from the wonderful work that all of you are doing in disseminating the ageless wisdom, and my goodness, do we need it just now. I would like to start with a meditation from H.P. Levatsky. Never utter these words, I do not know this, therefore it is false. One must study to know, know to understand, and understand to judge. Well, there is no more propitious a moment during this turbulent period in the world to focus our hearts and minds on recovering our human heritage. Let's ask a question that we've put on the slipcase of these four volumes. Our pressing need is for a renaissance and restitution of what it means to be really human. We humbly and sincerely acknowledge our debt and gratitude to science, but is there something missing in all this? Let's hear from someone who knew a thing or two about these things. Our age is proud of the progress it has made in man's intellectual development. The search and striving for truth and knowledge is one of the highest of man's qualities. Though of the pride is most loudly voiced by those who strive the least. And certainly, we should take care not to make the intellect our goal. It has, of course, powerful muscles, but no personality. It cannot lead, it can only serve. And it is not fastidious in its choice of a leader. This characteristic is reflected in the qualities of its priests, the intellectuals. The intellect has a sharp eye for methods and tools but is blind to ends and values. So it is no wonder that this fatal blindness is handed on from all to young and today involves a whole generation. Albert Einstein, of course, during the darkest days of World War II in 1943. Now we seem to be so enthralled by the prevailing mechanistic worldview that we have forgotten the subtleties of what it means to be truly human. We humans should get used to the idea that we are no longer mysterious souls. We are now hackable animals. That's what we are. Loudly proclaims one of the elite intellectual priests who has met with the heads of state in Europe and a keynote speaker at the 2020 World Economic Forum in Davos. A little bit of fuzzy logic, if we were no longer mysterious souls, means we once were, but uh, the politics of knowledge demands that we must never question the authority of the experts, the intellectual priests. But we can see quite readily how this crude ontological reduction of the human being to a complex biological machine in need of a sort of upgraded operating system, like a computer, how it has impoverished our sense of values and the disintegration we see in the world around us is ample proof. And the defining equation for the 21st century, and this is not just um, facetious or wisecrack at the World Economic Forum, the defining equation is 
B times C times D equals AH. In other words, biological knowledge multiplied by computing power multiplied by data equals R, hackable animal. And this is serious stuff. So what's the answer? That humanity has undoubtedly derived huge benefit from science and technology, but it has forgotten the key, the perennial philosophy, which reveals our spiritual origins. And therefore, the most important thing is to know ourselves. Because to know yourself is is to know humanity and the universe of which you are a part. So I'd like to present the overall contents of these volumes, of the four volumes of Unfolding Consciousness, to highlight their purpose and what value they serve and what is their relevance to the present age. Let's stop with a route map through the four volumes. What is their purpose, their relevance, and their contents? Volume one is a panoramic survey contrasting science with the perennial philosophy on consciousness and man. And then from this bird's eye perspective, we look down through the microscope into man's internal landscapes. How are we made? But then we look through the telescope and see man in relation to the universe. And volume four are the important references and further reading material. Volume one, the principal subjects are these, contrasting the scientific and the esoteric worldview the hard and soft problem of consciousness, that is, whether consciousness is generated by the brain or the brain cannot explain how consciousness arises and the contribution of the mystery teachings. Volume two deals with subtle bodies, death and after, the whole subject of paranormal phenomena, whether the brain is a wet computer or a bit more than that, and the divinity as we find in the united message of all world religions. And volume three deals with symbolism and mythology, the hermetic axiom, evolution, the powers latent in human beings, very much the second object of the Theosophical Society, and the question of immortality from the standpoint of science and the perennial philosophy. Transhumanism now is a big subject in science. Transhumanism or transcendence. The primacy of consciousness is uh, an important subject, of course. But what is the perennial philosophy? It's an elastic term. It was the term first used by Aldous Huxley and eternal wisdom, mystery teachings, esoteric doctrine are all similar terms. Various nuances of meaning, divine wisdom, Gupta Vidya, Theosophia, the wisdom of the gods, the great Isaac Newton, the Prisca Sapientia, the sacred wisdom. Of course, wisdom is sacred. Leibniz, the perennial philosophy, and Fritz of Schoen, the Danish mystic, putting the emphasis on the religious aspect. So unfolding consciousness obviously embraces this whole spectrum of nuanced meanings. Now let me say first of all, or pretty early on in this talk, that when I use the word man, it has nothing to do with male or female or gender. Etymologically, man derives from the uh, word mind, to think, 
it is cognate with the Sanskrit manas and manu, a thinking entity, the mind principle. So man has nothing to do with gender. I thought I'd just clarify that. But why do we place such emphasis on the perennial philosophy? Albert Schweitzer likened the perennialism to an evergreen characteristic of a tree that annually bears fruit, but never the same type of fruit. So you'll always get apples from the apple tree, but never the same kind and type of apple. In other words, the central wisdom, the eternal truths have got to be reformulated and recast in the modern idiom suitable for the age we live in. Now, perennial philosophy, of course, is the common heritage of mankind, but it's an umbrella term and its teachings are known as the mystery teachings of all ages or the thread doctrine or the esoteric doctrine, which theosophists are well aware of and familiar with. But let's just recall the essential meaning of the esoteric wisdom. It's the thread doctrine. Why such significance on the thread doctrine? So, as the great Blavatsky said, the thread doctrine is that doctrine which passes through and strings together all the philosophical, scientific, and religious systems and explains them on the basis of universal precepts, not beliefs. So if you think of a necklace of various beads, the beads, different colors, science, religion, and philosophy, and there is the reconciling thread that strings it all together as one system, as one necklace in this example. And of course, the approach is holistic rather than reductionist. So the perennial philosophy, the mystery teachings, the thread doctrine and occult science are all related terms. Now, I don't need to explain to theosophists the meaning of esoteric, but simply it means hidden, pertaining to the innermost, the noumena, the unseen causes that underlie the outward phenomena. Of course, a related term is occult science, and notwithstanding the idiotic connotations of witchcraft and all that nonsense, occult again means concealed, penetrating deeply into the causal mysteries of being. The science of the inner workings of universal nature, physical and psychic, mental and spiritual. But now let me make it clear that the mystery teachings are not a panacea for all the ills of the world in any age, but such is the stature of these teachings as the source of all true traditions that they contain the overarching solution to the problems of any epoch. But this doesn't mean that the mystery teachings disseminated through the great sages, this doesn't mean that these teachings had foreseen and analyzed every complexity of every generation, but rather that the mysteries had evolved a method whereby the mind was so trained in the fundamental verities and truths of life that it was able to cope intelligently with any emergency that might arise. So, for example, an expert motorist can hardly be expected to anticipate every pothole, every bump, every rough terrain along his route. But by virtue of his driving expertise, he can skillfully negotiate any blocks and any problems that he would encounter along his journey. So, similarly, by analogous reasoning, the faculties were so organized by a process of mental culture based on eternal truths, not beliefs, 
about the divine order of existence, for it was realized that problems, individual and societal, stem mainly from man's character and disposition, and only very secondarily from economic and material factors. Likewise, the health of the body depends primarily on the health of the mind, a truth that sadly our world leaders and their scientific advisors have realized at best only very partially as they grapple with the medical, human and humanitarian disasters that have befallen our age during the pandemic and other crises as well, of course. So unless we look behind the world's problems, material, economic, into the real and spiritual problems which they reflect, we cannot properly understand them or resolve them. So after this brief introduction, I'm going to present just the outline of the three volumes and pick out a few highlights. So we start with volume one, which is a route map and a panoramic survey. Science contrasted with the perennial philosophy. It provides an overall survey and appreciation of the field of inquiry. We ask, how can external airwaves on our eardrum plus neurochemical processes to the brain result in an internal experience, say, of a Chopin nocturne or a Schubert song that can move us to tears? Science knows all about physical mechanisms, but what can it say about a transformative experience? And the great Schrodinger realized this when he said, we do not belong to this material world that science constructs for us. And science pretends to answer questions in these high domains, but sometimes they're so silly, these answers, we don't take them seriously. Well, Schrodinger doesn't. Unfortunately, a lot of scientists do take these answers rather seriously. So then this defines the legitimate boundaries of science and justifies the need for invoking the perennial philosophy. And therefore, volume one is in two sections, mainstream science, its triumphs, and its limitations. Then the perennial philosophy that resolves these problems. Always bearing in mind that Max Planck said, we can never understand the ultimate mystery of nature unless we include ourselves as part of the mystery that we're trying to solve. Section one then prepares the ground for the perennial philosophy to complement science. We ask who we are and then describe how even Nobel scientists strongly disagree about ideas on mind and, and consciousness, outline the paradigm of science, its ideology, its assumptions, and the ensuing modern scientific picture. Then we need to strain our eyes to look beyond what I call uncomfortable science, and the breakdown of materialism. And by looking beyond, we witness a new continent of thought, seminal insights of psychology that have undermined the dogma that thought is solely a brain productive function. Section two justifies the need for the perennial philosophy. In these chapters, the mystery teachings of all ages what occult science affirms, the mystery teachings about man, and then a major recapitulation before two appendices showing how physics and cosmology and how biology 
and evolution have progressed. But the overriding message of volume one is exactly as Einstein realized that the direct truth can be approached by moving beyond and rising above the plane of intellect in which doubts and debates will always reign. Recall his speech where he talked about the intellect has powerful muscles, no personality. It cannot lead the intellect. It can only serve. So just a few highlights from volume one. The paradigm of science and its assumptions is a complex chapter. So I stop all these complex chapters with a tabular summary as a sort of root map with major section headings, the subject matter, and their intended purpose. The great William James, who was a, a member of the Esophagus Society, all those years ago talked about three functional dependencies of thought. The first, productive, the second, releasing, and the third, transmissive. Productive means the brain generates thought rather like a kettle generates steam. Releasing means permissive. The crossbow releases the arrow. The crossbow doesn't produce the arrow. But the most important is transmissive. And here the great psychologist quoted from Shelley that life like a dome of colored glass stains the white radiance of eternity. It is vital for science to take due note of the great poets. Poets are the legislators of our age, as John Keats once said. So to illustrate the transmissive function, the analogy between light and light, white light split into a prism, and here our psyche, our brains, split like the dome of many colored glass, splits the white radiance of truth into all these various psychological colors which I've called sorrow, confusion, um, equilibrium, happiness. The outpouring of the perennial philosophy, the evergreen tree with its roots in heaven and branches on earth can be displayed like this. Prehistoric ages and historic ages. And the mystery teachings about man, a very significant chapter in volume one. And here I've summarized that the whole purpose of the mysteries is to unfold the man's inner nature. And I've described the mysteries of antiquity, the American mysteries, and yes, the contemporary mystery teachings, the theosophical movement. Not forgetting that we live in the age we do now, so related 19th century teachings. Always bearing in mind that the consummate achievement of the mysteries is man united with himself and how the lower nature may be most speedily raised to function in its highest perfected purity. This knowledge of how man's composite nature can be most speedily unfolded constitutes the secret or esoteric doctrine of all ages and the main objective on the mysteries. 
So dealing just with the Greek mysteries here as an example, the Bacchic rites of the Greek mystery school are based on the allegory of the god Bacchus being torn to pieces by the giant titans, who then scattered the dismembered body of the god far and wide. Jupiter, the father of Bacchus and the Demiogos of the universe, beholding the crime, hurled his thunderbolt at the titans, reducing their bodies to ashes. And from the ashes of the titans, the human race was created. However, however, the ashes of the titans also contained a portion of the Bacchic body, which the titans had partly devoured. Thus, the mundane life of every man was said to contain a part of the Bacchic, therefore godly, life, and part of the titanic life. His higher immortal nature and his lower nature. His higher immortal nature as the sacred life of the god Bacchus and the lower nature. So the Bacchic state signifies the unity of the rational soul in a state of self-knowledge and the titanic state, the diversity of the rational soul, which by virtue of being scattered loses the consciousness of its own oneness and unity. We all know that when our mind is scattered, how our judgment is impaired and how we can, act, we can act irrationally and foolishly, which we would never know, of course, if our uh, mind were focused. But how did the giants accomplish the fall of the god Bacchus? By getting him to be fascinated by his own image in a mirror, signifying engrossment in a sea of illusion, Maya, of course which signals the downfall of man. So the ordinary man is capable of either a Bacchic, that is a rational existence, or a titanic, irrational existence, and for the vast majority, both existences in varying proportions. Now I put it to you, given the hordes of uh, holiday makers, at major tourist sites, totting their selfie sticks, stupid little sticks that almost poke you in the eye, are human narcissistic traits basically any different now than at one time? Beauty products, fashion products, fashion industry, celebrity culture, all to do with getting fascinated with oneself, with one's physical self. We can't get away from ourselves. In addition to the teaching, of course, on the twofold composite nature of man, we find a clear message in the Greek teachings that sorrow and suffering is the consequence of immortal man, our higher nature, falling narcissistically in love with his own shadow or image, mistaking his body and personality for his true self, and thereby uniting his reasoning principle with his earthly desires, so giving up truth and reality to dwell in appearance and illusions. Where are these mystery centers? Where were these teachings taught? Here are the Elephanta Caves in India, about 60 miles from Bombay, where I was born. And here are the Elora Caves, located near Aurangabad, far from the madding crowd in those days, of course. It is of deepest significance to me that after he made his historic venture 
through ancient Iran into Hindustan, the legendary Pythagoras remained for several years as a pupil and initiate of the learned Brahmins of Elephanta and Elora. And in fact, the name of Pythagoras is still preserved in the records of the Brahmins as Yavanacharya, the Ionian teacher. Then after returning from travels, Pythagoras established his famous school at Crotona in southern Italy. And he, of course, would have been delighted to give a talk at Crotona in California. But there in Italy, he taught the secrets of mathematics, music and astronomy, considered by him to be the triune foundation of all arts and science. The legendary Pythagoras, revered by the greatest mathematical minds the world over, Isaac Newton being one of them. So far in science, I have really resented the triumph of science in that science has discovered just about everything from the largest dimension, relativity theory, to the very smallest dimension, quantum theory. But it is a triumph of mindlessness, so to speak. I'm not saying scientists are mindless. I'm saying mind has not entered their consideration other than mind being a product of matter. So the next phase of science must surely be to invoke mind as a central theme in their consideration. So we need to look now at the world and human beings from a higher standpoint through the lens of the mystery teachings of diverse world cultures that does not exclude the triumphs of science, but transcends the dictates of scientific materialism. And I cannot sufficiently stress our gratitude to science. But science does not answer questions in these higher domains, as Schrodinger realized. So let's move on to volume two of Unfolding Consciousness. Volume two with the subtitle, Peering Down the Microscope, Looking at Man and how he is made. Robert Browning, the great poet and author, realized that we are really, in a sense, three souls making up one soul. So, volume two is in three sections. Occult science on man's compositions. We ask, is man just a biological machine? And then the perennial philosophy, its incredible unity and its common teaching from the East and the West on the constitution and nature of man at all levels of his being. Man's occult anatomy and physiology, using the word anatomy and physiology, uh, from medical science, how we are structured and how we function, our constitution and our nature. So there's a lot of confusing terminology, obviously, we must clarify that and then describe man as structure. And having described how he is constituted, we know how he works, his nature, the meaning of soul, his three primary vehicles of consciousness, and a major section on death. Is death the ending of all, or is death transition? I would suggest that death is really time at the door of eternity. 
section two deals with man's brain and mind, where we clarify some common misconceptions. A major chapter on the question of whether the brain is just a wet computer, so to speak, a rather hideous term, wet computer. But anyway, that's the word we hear nowadays, and whether we are just lumbering robots. But in order to present the case, we don't just uh, state opinions. We have to detail what the scientists say, what their philosophical weaknesses are, how their arguments break down, and how we resolve this conundrum. And will robots eventually overtake humanity, as some people like to think? The third section, major section, volume two, on man's internal landscapes, presents the unity of the perennial philosophy, ancient and modern, from all of these various systems, ancient, modern, east and west. And then we're going to see how we're going to construct and energize a human being. Using the simile of a temple and a power station. And then a few technical matters. So some highlights from volume two. Plato's teaching on the double nature of the mind principle, this is absolutely central in a theosophical doctrine. The age-old problem of good and evil, how often do we say to ourselves, why did I do something I shouldn't have done? My conscience told me I shouldn't, but I did it. But sometimes, why do I act so virtuously? We call the wonderful passage in the Key to Theosophy, where Blavatsky quotes Plato saying that when the soul, Psyche, allies herself to noose, all is well. But when Psyche attaches to Anoia, that's when problems start. Nous, the god Bacchus, Anoia, elements of the giant titans. And we see a wonderful tarot card symbol of that here, where a youth is flanked by two maidens. And the point is they both love him. That's very important. They both love him. But the youth must choose. Does he choose vice or does he choose virtue? In other words, your virtues and your vices both love you, so to speak. But you have to choose. We have to choose whether we're going to rise to noose or descend to annoya. The principle as a man is a major, major theme in theosophical thought, always emphasizing that we are one human being, but there are many ways of looking at us, the many anatomical maps. So this is the uh, traditional taxonomy. One unified being. We can look at ourselves in terms of the mortal and the immortal. Soul is the generic term that interfaces between spirit and body. And this is the most sophisticated occult classification. The higher mind and the lower mind. We haven't got two minds, but mind can function in two ways. The divided mind, so to speak, and Ian McGilchrist, in his um, first wonderful book, The Master and Its Misery, 
uh, talks about the left brain and the right brain function, which has a very direct parallel with theosophical doctrine. So the mind can work in two ways. It can rise or it can fall. So it is our choice. Do we want to behave like the minotaur or do we want to rise to the stars? In the first case, at its lowest level, there is unspeakable brutality and at the highest, ineffable transcendence. So the old problem is one of the ego. The ego is not to be despised. We need an ego. But is the ego going to be our servant or our master? If it's our servant, it will focus our energies and our thoughts and desires towards the higher purpose. If it's our master, it will block the higher light. So we display a spectrum of consciousness. We can either trample on the fallen or lend a helping hand to the fallen. And these are all the various characteristics in this whole spectrum. And here, we have the rather unfortunate isolative sectarian attitudes. I, me, I come first, and all the rest of it. Whereas over here, instead of I, me, mine, our thoughts are we, our, and us, because we identify with the higher self rather than getting attached to personality and gender. Death is transition, and there is an exponential increase now in near-death experiences in this whole subject of extended mind and whether consciousness survives physical death. And science is beginning to take note of this. And I put it to you that if Pythagoras, Francis Bacon, Yogananda, John Keats, and Isaac Newton affirmed essentially the same message, I put it to you that science now really needs to take this very seriously. And in volume two, I have described in considerable detail this whole process, starting with life on earth and starting again with a new life on earth. This is a diagram of um, Kamaloka taken from uh, Botticelli's uh, depiction of Dante's Divine Comedy. Now, the chapter on harmony with the major world traditions, I've split into three major sections, the theosophical tradition, the Eastern traditions, and the Western traditions. And uh, just an, as an example, and you're certainly not meant to read the detail, but for example, the parallels with the Egyptian, Indian, and Zoroastrian traditions Everything is laid alongside the fundamental teaching in theosophy. So however you cross-section the human being, so to speak, all the teachings from all the great world systems can be mapped onto the fundamental teaching in theosophy of the septenary constitution. With the Greek teachings, we can do the same. Whether Plato and Socrates, Pythagoras or Plutarch, all their teachings can be mapped 
on the septenary constitution as taught in theosophy in occult science. A harmony of philosophers is very important and the great Leibniz suggested that we need to create a framework that displays the harmony of philosophers. So as an example, think of the white light of truth as above. Now that truth is ineffable, invisible, but it is expressed and diffused through many teachings. And these wisdom streams of teacher A, B, and C, these streams are not contradictory or exclusive, but are complementary and inclusive. And our job is to put a sort of convex lens or converging lens to bring these streams together, acting as a reconciling system of harmony. Such that we may reflect from where we are the central truths from above. And this converging lens is, so to speak, the second object of the Theosophical Society. To understand the comparative sciences, religions and philosophies, I'm paraphrasing it, of course. To see how they come together they're not the same thing, but they act in harmony. So finally, uh, on volume two, how do we construct a man? How are we made? Robert Browning again, three souls which make up one soul. How do we make a house? We start with the foundation and the apex. The physical body, we start with the physical material and the divine self. The spiritual soul, human soul and animal soul are the three stories, so to speak, of the house. And how do we function? Think of a power station with power, electricity from a power station to domestic houses. But you can't put a power station in your house. It would blow it up. So we need transformers. We need three transformer substations. And these transformers, so to speak, are the spiritual soul, the human soul, and the animal soul that, so to speak, drop down the voltage from the source to a level that can be handled by the physical body. So this is Browning again, three souls which make up one soul. Finally, volume three. But before that, let's just remind ourselves of the difference between the exoteric and the esoteric. This is how NASA understand life. Darwinian evolution, self-sustaining chemical system. But now look when Blavatsky says that everything in the universe is living. And just because we can't understand life or see it, we have no right to say that consciousness does not exist in stones or other planets. And there is no such thing as dead or blind matter. And these find no place in the conceptions of esotericism, which never stops at surface appearances. The universals are the realities and the particulars exist only in name and human fancy. So root map through volume three, which is gazing through the telescope. Showing how the wisdom and intelligence that have gone into the body are also the same wisdom and intelligence in the whole universe. 
symbolism, the hermetic axiom, and evolution. So section one on symbolism. Symbols and symbolism is the language of the mystery teachings, but they can be misused and abused. And we give many examples of symbols here. Then symbolic representations of cosmos, nature and man, man, the measure of all things, and symbolic representations of the principles of man. The hermetic axiom the relation between the human principles with cosmos, chemical elements, and color and sound. The cosmogenesis, the unfolding of consciousness. Anthropogenesis, the unfolding of consciousness from the divine self to the human. These are two important chapters, uh, external sensation, to internal sensation. Templeton World Charity Foundation is awarding a prize of $20 million, I say it again, $20 million, for cleverly designed experiments to show how the brain generates consciousness. And I put it to you that it is asking the wrong question the brain does not generate consciousness. The process from external sensation to internal experience has been beautifully stated in the perennial philosophy. And section three deals with man's limitless evolution. We summarize our theme and move towards immortality and end with a heavy mathematical codicil. Now, symbolism, as an example, in the Druidic tradition, you have the silent pool, fed by four underground streams that then flow on outwards on the surface. And the four underground streams are these, the narrative of the legend, the perennial tradition, personal gnosis, and man's transpersonal nature. So if our inner nature is fed by these streams, then the life of the five output senses will be well. The Kabbalah. How did the world come into being? The wonderful saying of Schiller, the universe is a thought of the creator, of the deity. And since this ideal thought form has flowed into actuality, the world born thereof has realized the plan of its creator. And it's our job to understand and rediscover this. Now, when something overflows into actuality, what happens? What happens when your milk pan overflows? The milk flows firstly onto the kitchen table and then onto the floor. It doesn't flow upwards and hit the ceiling, right? Likewise, we have deity in repose, deity in emanation, and the boundless light. And this is the deity. This is the overflowing of deity as the boundless light to create the macrocosm, the unmanifest worlds, and the manifest worlds in the macrocosm. In the microcosm, we have this perfect structure. 
and it can all be knitted together beautifully on the tree of life. The three factors, repose, awakening, and activity. The lotus, the well-known wonderful symbol, the petals will wither away and fall off like our mortal vestures, but the seed pod containing the lotus seeds will sprout new flowers. Three grand centers of consciousness power in the human body. the heart, the brain, and the generative system. Science is obsessed with just the brain, which is indeed its role is greatest physical dignity. Its function though is the link by which through rational intelligence, life and form, spirit and matter are united. But the heart is the spiritual superior and the generative system is the least in physical dignity, but of course the greatest in physical importance, because through that source of power, physical organisms are produced. So which center predominates depends on whether one is a materialist, an intellectualist, or the initiate who balances all centers. The so human body is a divine musical instrument and the veena, the uh, beautiful Indian instrument, mirrors the human spine. And here you can see the goddess Saraswati playing the veena. Neurocardiology is a burgeoning subject now in science where they have realized that the heart is not just a pump, but it has subtle functions. And really the heart is the seat of consciousness, whereas the brain, so to speak, objectifies the invisible light from the heart to visible light that we can perceive with our physical senses. So the root cause of the mind-brain conundrum was stated by Sir Francis Walsh, the great neurologist, years ago, that by in identifying the instrument with its user, it causes confusion. The mind and brain are not the same, even though the instrument, the brain, is used by the mind, so to speak. And by analogy with the pianist and the piano, the mind corresponds to the pianist and the brain to the piano. If either be inadequate, so will be the music. If the brain produce thought, then the blood, bone and flesh of the human brain secrete thought. Then the wood and string of a violin secrete music, never mind the violinist. There's a lovely story of the great Yasha Heifetz in Tel Aviv taking a taxi and the taxi driver said, Mr. Heifetz, your violin produces such beautiful sounds and Heifetz actually took it out of his case and tapped it. Does it produce beautiful sounds? What about me, the violinist? This is a central problem, this obsession with the vehicle and forgetting the operator, the musician, the mind behind the brain. So the resolution of the mind-brain conundrum is a major chapter, and I put it to you, it has been resolved, not because I'm so clever, 
the ancient wisdom, not all science, has done it. And don't, for goodness sake, get uh, immersed in reading all the details. It's all in the chapter. But the three stages are man as divine thought, the archetypal man, and physical man. This is Blavatsky's diagram from the collected writings. And this is Sankhya philosophy and Christianity, showing the unity between all great systems, whether from the East or the West. So closing down now, as one must, I've summarized the fundamental propositions of the perennial philosophy in terms of occultism, science, esotericism, and the hermetic axiom. Volume four contains all of these, and I've especially emphasized the work of uh, Blavatsky, Paul Brunton, Manley Hall, and Rupert Sheldrake, who has done so much to bring science and spirituality in conversation with each other. And to help the reader, we have all of these navigational aids and literary aids. So you don't have to read each volume nonstop. There is a ribbon marker so you know where you last left off. All chapters have their abstracts in the introductory and fuller synopsis at the beginning of every chapter. So to close now, let me give you two examples of unfolding consciousness. These are the mathematical papers of Sir Isaac Newton, which are rarely known about because they were assembled in, in the 1930s. Eight huge volumes. But this is what Newton did in the whole of his long and highly productive life. He researched all of these subjects and it is no wonder that Blavatsky gives such important references to Sir Isaac Newton and mentions his work in no uncertain terms in the occult science portions of volume one of The Secret Doctrine. An example from science, now an example from music, from a man who at the age of 35, landed up in a pauper's grave. The last 11 months of Mozart's life, when he was plagued by all of these problems, financial desperation, ill health, deteriorating health, and declining popularity. And this is his output in the last 11 months of his life. And all of these legendary works were composed in the last four months while he was suffering from all of this. So next time you feel you have a headache and don't want to get down to work, just bear in mind what Mozart did when he was suffering from a lot more than just a headache. So, a miracle of unfolding consciousness, a prodigy of nature. But it didn't come easily. He said, it is a mistake to think that the practice of my art has become easy. And that really provides perfect demonstration of what we see in the idyll of the white lotus. Yet each man is his own absolute lawgiver and our soul is immortal and is the future of a thing whose growth and splendor has no limit.